City of Toronto is following a move by Vancouver to address the opioid overdose crisis. The city's Board of Health is set to vote on whether to pursue de decriminalization of small amounts of illegal drugs. And if approved, the Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Eileen Davila, would then ask Health Canada for the exemption. Toronto reported 531 opioid-related overdose deaths in 2020, an 81% increase compared to the previous year. Dr. Davila, good to have you on the program. I certainly want to talk about the proposal around decriminalizing small amounts of drugs for personal use. Uh, but first, I do want to get your thoughts on Omicron, this variant uh, that we are now all talking about in this country and again around the world, really. Uh, from your perch, Toronto Public Health, are you investigating any potential cases right now? So, you know, at this point, David, I understand we're certainly on the lookout and are participating in follow up of people with with travel histories, particularly to those areas of the world that have been implicated thus far. Uh, but, uh, you know, I don't have any news to report, but I think we should expect that just given the global nature of our city, that we, we shouldn't be surprised uh, when we, we find cases in Toronto in the not too distant future. So if there's a certain inevitability to it, I, I recognize there are real limitations on what we know about Omicron right now. What what reason is there in your mind to be concerned well, you know, uh, what we've heard, certainly, and these are still early days, but what we've heard so far is that there are particular mutations, a number of mutations associated with this variant uh, that have been associated with increased transmissibility and uh, may have some association as well with immune escape, meaning that the virus has greater capacity to evade uh, the immune system, even if one has had a previous history of infection um, and or vaccine. So these are the kinds of things that certainly give rise to concern. But I think there's lots of reasons for us to also be um, you know, uh, uh, um, I guess reassured. Uh, we've seen an incredible amount of international cooperation. You know, the, the variant was only identified a few days ago. And here we are, uh, you know, recognizing that it is in a variety of other countries in the world, which requires a lot of international cooperation. I think add to that, that at the end of the day, this is still COVID-19. So there's a lot of things that we've learned over the course of the last, you know, two years now that we can put to good use. Certainly vaccine is an important strategy and as well those personal measures that we can take uh, to help reduce risk. So things like mask use, social distancing or physical distancing, mm -hmm. uh, making sure that we're socializing in smaller groups um, and especially with people who are vaccinated. Uh, and staying home when sick. So we have lots of, of, of control available to us because we have a fair amount of learning uh, that's occurred over the last two years. Yeah, and I get that, I mean, two weeks ago, the world didn't know about Omicron. So indeed, very early days. But how long would it take, given the level of, of knowledge and scientific sophistication we have right now, to actually know if indeed it is more transmissible and if indeed it does have a, a greater propensity for vaccine escape. So everything I've heard to date suggests that it's in the order of a few weeks uh, by which we should be able to have more information. And certainly observing that which is happening clinically, look Looking at the experience of the various cases, you know, both what's happening in, in Southern Africa and as, as cases have been found increasingly in other parts of the world, understanding the experiences of those individual cases and what transmission happens, uh, I think will help to inform us further around what other actions might need to be taken and how much concern do we need to, uh, you know, approach this with. But for now, we have a lot of tools in our toolkit. And I would just remind people that vaccination continues to be an, one of the most important tools in our toolkit. But of course, there's a lot of control that we can exercise around mitigating and reducing risk for each of us. At the provincial level, um, we know that your counterpart, Dr. Kieran Moore, has suggested uh, an acceleration of uh, the third shot, the booster shot for, for people 
uh, who aren't yet eligible to be able to get it sooner, perhaps not waiting six months. But there's also talk politically that perhaps Canada and with the busiest airport in the country being Toronto Pearson, where you are, um, to do PCR testing at arrival as the Brits have now decided to do. On either of those points, do you see a case for doing that? So, you know, I think that there are a lot of scientific individuals uh, and people, agencies who are charged with this, who are actively looking at these questions. Uh, certainly in respect of third doses, we've received some advice from the National Advisory Committee on Immunization. I understand that provincial committees who are charged with this responsibility are also actively looking at this question. So we'll look forward to hearing advice from them. With respect to testing, I understand that's also the subject of a great deal of conversation that's happening right now between the provinces and the and the federal government. And, uh, you know, I, I think that there's, a, again, a lot of technology, a lot of lessons learned uh, that are, are actively being explored for deployment on the ground to help us bring this situation under better control so that we can all breathe a little easier. I want to shift gears and talk about decriminalization here uh, for the remaining time that we have with you. You're presenting a report to the Toronto Board of Health in early December. It would recommend decriminalization of the possession of small amounts of illicit drugs. Why, why is the time right now for Toronto? Well, you know, David, unfortunately, this has been an issue uh, for Toronto. We've seen the negative impacts uh, associated with uh, our current drug policy and our approach to drugs. However, we have seen a real worsening uh, over the last uh, little while. So, in fact, when we look at our data, um, in 2020 in Toronto, we had 843 suspected drug-related deaths. That's a 71% increase over the previous year. And when you look at opioid toxicity-related deaths alone, we had 531 of these in Toronto in 2020, an 81% increase relative to what we saw in 2019. So there's no question, while there has been the COVID-19 pandemic, we have actually seen a worsening of the crisis on the ground in respect of, of drug-related overdose and deaths here in Toronto. Hence, we're putting forth this more public health comprehensive approach mm -hmm. to drugs and drug policy. So, so the process is you recommend it, it goes to the Toronto Board of Health, they make a decision, but ultimately you have to get an exemption from the law um, through the federal government. Had those discussions already begun to try to pave the way to, to get an exemption from the feds? So we routinely have conversation with the federal government in respect of issues around drug policy, but we have yet to make a formal submission to them on this issue. That's something that will follow. We have a report going to the Board of Health, uh, the Toronto Board of Health, as you rightfully point out, next week. And from there, uh, we'll be in a position to uh, shortly thereafter provide something to the federal government and engage in that very important conversation around decriminalization. And, and can you help our audience understand how decriminalization will help society at large? Because I think there will there will be some people who are looking at what are quite serious drugs uh, and are concerned about decriminalizing any aspect of that. Can you explain the sort of the societal benefit of doing this? Well, I think, David, in fact, decriminalization is only one aspect of the approach that we're putting forward is an alternative approach to what's going on right now. So as I've indicated, we've seen an exponential increase in respect of deaths and, and uh, over the course of the last year. So clearly the system that we have right now isn't actually doing a good job in terms of protecting the health of people here in our city. Uh, and in particular, uh, for people who use drugs. Uh, what we're proposing is rather than taking a criminal approach, which actually stigmatizes drug users and pushes them, actually forces them into increasingly unsafe behavior, we're proposing a health-focused approach. This is a health issue and it should be addressed as such. So while decriminalization is part of that, um, what is also called for in the report that I'm bringing forward to the Board of Health is um, the scaling up 
of prevention services, the scaling up of harm reduction resources and services, the scaling up of treatment options, and, and particularly making those treatment options available to people at the moment that they need them. But as well, we're also calling for all the other supports that are needed to help people be successful in actually experiencing better health, which includes affordable and supportive housing. So this is a more comprehensive, health-focused approach that we're calling for, of which decriminalization is just one part. Dr. Eileen Davila, thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.